Greetings, Culture Warriors. It is I, Jeff Vieira, the author of Culture is Everything, and your host for this latest dispatch from the front. You know, there's few things that I enjoy more than stories of government incompetence. Having served for a time in the military, which is part of our federal government here in the United States, we used to collect such stories um, for pure entertainment value. Anyone who thinks that a bureaucracy is the solution to any problem except that things are going too well is simply out of their godforsaken minds or lying to you. And large bureaucracies in particular are prone to such monumental excesses of stupidity as to just make the most optimistic person into a well-worn cynic like a Voltaire. Today's story comes with this trigger warning for this reason. If you are a doe-eyed optimist who believes in your heart and soul that government is the answer, you may want to drop off now. This story from CNBC by Kevin Bruniger. Postal Service Chief Under Fire admits unintended consequences of his policy overhaul. The embattled new chief of the U.S. Postal Service acknowledged in an internal memo to his staff that his sweeping operational changes have brought unintended consequences to the government agency, NBC News reported Friday. But Postmaster General Louis DeJoy defended his overhaul of the post office despite reports of widespread mail delays and increasing scrutiny from lawmakers, mail workers' unions, and the media in the run-up to the 2020 election. Let me be clear about the reasons behind our restructuring and the need for our plan. Our financial condition is dire, DeJoy said in the memo, which was sent to USPS staff on Thursday, NBC reported. Our critics are quick to point out our finances, yet they offer no solution. Well, I will offer you some solutions after reading this article. Since starting his role in June, DeJoy has implemented a slew of significant changes that he says are intended to stabilize the post office, which has seen its financial troubles compounded by the coronavirus pandemic. These, those changes reportedly include crackdowns on overtime pay and curtailing late trips for mail carriers, as well as an overhaul of agency leadership. In the memo, DeJoy admitted, unfortunately, this transformative initiative has had unintended consequences that impacted our overall service levels. He didn't elaborate on specific consequences. He added, however, recent changes are not the only contributing factors. Over the years, we have grown undisciplined in our mail and packaging and processing schedules, causing an increase in delayed mail between processing facilities and delivery units. Lawmakers of both parties have called on DeJoy to reverse his new policies. Democrats fear the changes could impact the presidential race, where a record number of voters are expected to cast their ballots by mail to avoid risking exposure to the coronavirus. How will the dead and felonious and non-citizen vote if the U.S. Postal Service isn't there to blame? Worries about the election have only grown this week amid reports of USPS warning states that it cannot guarantee all mail-in ballots will arrive in time to be counted in the presidential race. 46 states in Washington, D.C. have received letters from the agency's general counsel, Thomas J. Marshall. The letters were issued at the end of July and planned before DeJoy was selected as the new postmaster general, according to the newspaper. In remarks at the Postal Service Board of Governors' open session meeting, Last week, DeJoy insisted the USPS has ample capacity to deliver all election mail securely and on time in accordance with our delivery standards, and we will do so. Now, note the following paragraph here, because this is key to how this is going to get played. DeJoy is a major donor to Republicans and committees supporting President Donald Trump, who has repeatedly claimed widespread mail and voting will lead to a fraudulent election. Okay. The reason that they are pointing this out and the reason that they are making a big deal about it is for that reason. Because it will allow them, when there are inevitable issues with absentee ballots, the Democrats will claim, 
that the postmaster general was to blame. And these policies, whatever they are, were the problem. That is what they will say. The idea is to get the election thrown to the House of Representatives, which decides in the event that there is no clear winner in the Electoral College of the United States, who the president will be. Now, who runs the House of Representatives? Why, it happens to be the Democrats. It is the only part of government that they currently run. I shouldn't. I, I should say that they currently hold the highest office in. Because the fact of the matter is, is that through their deep state operatives, they pretty much run it all. But this will allow them to say, aha, we had to vote via mail for the pandemic, and thanks to this Republican donor, it got all messed up. Clearly, we must let the House decide. So they'll use this to trigger a constitutional crisis in the hope that they can do in the House of Representatives what they cannot do at the ballot boxes on Election Day, which is drag the creepy corpse of Dementia Joe Biden over the finish line so that they can make Kamala Harris president of the United States. That's the plan. So, from a culture and values perspective. Oh, and by the way, if, if you don't believe that that's the plan, just read the last two paragraphs of the article uh, where the Democrats cannot help but telegraph that that is the plan. Okay, I leave that to you. So from a culture and values perspective, what does this say? I'm going to ask you to belay that for a second because I have a second article for you on this subject and it sheds a little light. This is from Vox. Adam Clark Estes. The United States Postal Service is dealing with crippling backlogs of letters and packages. A postmaster in upstate New York recently told their union that the regular mail was two days behind and for the first time in their career, express priority mail was not going out on time. Despite a surge in package delivery during the pandemic, postal workers are no longer able to work overtime. Hmm. And fewer mail trucks are on the road. If you if your own mail seems delayed or unpredictable, it's not a one-off problem. Mail service has been disrupted nationwide in recent weeks due to a series of factors. While the USPS has been suffering financially for years, the coronavirus pandemic has delivered an existential threat to the agency. The self-funded Postal Service has been seeking billions in aid from Congress, an effort that's been stymied by President Trump, who has long had a contentious relationship with the USPS and pu has pushed to privatize it. Oh, the horror. And now the USPS is adjusting the cost-cutting policies put in place by its new Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, who is a Trump donor and a longtime Republican fundraiser. The situation became even more uncertain when DeJoy announced a major restructuring of the Postal Service in a memo released on August 7th. The plan involves the reassignment of 23 postal executives. <laughs> postal executives we have. In an overhaul that, according to the United to the Washington Post, de-emphasizes decades worth of institutional postal knowledge and centralizes power around DeJoy. The shift in power stands to further complicate the new Postmaster General's relationship with Democrats in Congress who want him investigated. Now, when you hear somebody complaining about that, they got rid of a bunch of middle managers, a bunch of do-nothing middlemen. That's what that means. The Postal Service's problems continue to batter its reputation as news emerged August 14th that the agency sent a letter of 46 states in Washington, D.C. in late July were, were warning that it could not guarantee the on-time delivery of all their mail-in ballots and called for states to reconsider their ballot deadlines. Among those measures are removal of 10% of the Postal Service's high-speed sorting machines. A large number of these machines, which process flat mail like ballots, are being removed from key battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Florida. All of this means that the future of the Postal Service is in jeopardy. It was actually, actually in big trouble months ago when postal leaders warned that without intervention from Congress, you, the USPS could run out of cash as soon as September. What's happening now is even more urgent. Decisions being made by Trump allies are leading to delays that could motivate the Postal Service's biggest customers to send their packages through competitors like UPS and FedEx. And according to some, the strategy could have devastating consequences. Okay. There's a lot more to it, uh, but it's all kind of uh, nonsense from the, the union. 
So the challenge was given that few people have anything to say, few critics have anything to say about how to improve the Postal Service. So let me give you a couple of things to immediately improve the Postal Service. Number one is to eliminate the Postal Workers Union. Put it out for bid and hire a workforce, which, oh, by the way, is readily available now because of layoffs elsewhere. So you can snatch up people who can actually carry a mailbag with a smile on their face and deliver it ah, up to your very walk even. And why can you do that? Because package volume is high enough. The thing that makes no sense in all of this is that with more people ordering things through the mail, that should enable the Postal Service to spread its fixed costs over a much wider package volume. That means that without increasing the cost of postage, you wind up with money just flowing in. Well, that would mean that if you were profitable because the Postal Service has long operated at a loss because the Postal Workers Union has long milked the federal government out of every dime it could and long resisted the time-honored notion set by the Pony Express in the 19th century that the mail will always go through not on my watch, says the Postal Workers Union. Well, they haven't been profitable. And the reason that Trump and others in government are a little sick of it is because they always do the wimpy from Popeye routine. They'll go to Congress and they'll say, we'll gladly give you better service on Tuesday for a billion dollars today. And they get their billion, and then the service continues to slide. You will have noticed that unlike when I was growing up, we used to have postal routes that were walked by the carriers. They didn't have vehicles. If they did have a vehicle, they left it and then walked the neighborhood, up and down the neighborhood, delivering the mail to everyone's home. This was when a lot more things moved through mail because there was no email. And so all your document traffic had to move through the, the, the mail, as well as all your package traffic. But generally, the volume of mail was a lot more towards letter mail than it was towards package mail back in the day. And so they would take their big bag stuffed to overflowing with letters and a couple of packages, and they'd walk up and down the streets of your neighborhood, and they'd talk to you for a couple minutes, and then they'd get on their way because they had, they had stuff to deliver. And every day at the same time, within five or ten minutes, you would see your mailman, regardless of the weather, trudging up the walk with your stuff. That has long since changed. Now, they drive up in their Jeep, and they go to a place within your subdivision, hopefully within a few blocks of your house, and then you have to walk to your mailbox and get it. Uh, and if there's a package, they will have one or two larger boxes that they stuff the package into. But the mail person won't darken your doorway at all. Unlike, say, by the way, the FedEx and the UPS and the Amazon driver who come right up to your door and bring you your package. Somehow they found a way to do that. And your postal service with all those decades of experience can't figure out how to get it done. If you've gone in to your post office, you'll find that the front office of it is run just as poorly and inefficiently. You wait a lot longer than you do in a UPS store. Often, you don't get what you need. And then you have to proceed on your way somewhat more dissatisfied than when you walked in. That's generally the case with the Postal Service. That's why the UPS stores have been successful. That's why there are places like mailboxes, etc., which are so successful. That's why you can go out and for 18 bucks a month, you can pay for the privilege of being able to order your stamps online so you never have to set foot in a post office because the experience has become so lousy and DMV-like that you're willing to pay a premium every month even if you don't print a single stamp just to avoid it.
and to maintain your sanity in the process. So how do we fix it? I'll tell you how we fix it. Eliminate priority mail and one-day mail and the premium mail services. They can't do it. They're not capable of it. So you have to simplify their operation. So what you do is you make them what they were intended to be, which was the primary carrier for normal, within about a week, mail delivery. And that's what you do. You focus exclusively on that. That takes the pressure off of your system and it eliminates service levels that you are incapable of meeting anyway. As we mentioned, you get rid of the union. That takes out the major obstacle to reform and cultural transformation. And your culture needs to fundamentally transform because what you have in place now is a bunch of time servers who are just looking to make it to their pension and do as little as possible along the way. They don't have any pride in the service. They only want to erode the standard, and they really would like the federal government to crack down on UPS and on Amazon and on FedEx and on DHL and on all their other other competitors who are making them look bad. That's what they want. If they had their way, Congress would ban better performance than they can provide. Here is another thing that would help the U.S. Postal Service. Eliminate the congressional franking privilege. That's where congressmen get to postage-free badger their constituents with all sorts of mailings. It is an unfair advantage for the incumbent and unnecessary, given that they all have emails that they use to badger you anyway with. So let's get rid of that. That will ease up the pressure on the Postal Service. Here's another thing that will help tremendously, and that is this. Get rid of the community mailboxes and deliver to people's homes. Now, how will this help? It will help because the mail carrier cannot help but learn the community that way. They will get a feel for when service is bad. It will also encourage them to the same kind of practices which are followed at the competitors of the U.S. Postal Service. For example, if you want to track a package in real time, you ain't going to do it through the U.S. Postal Service. The best you get is major events when they check in and check out. But through their competitors, you can pretty much track where it's at. That kind of capability is necessary if you're going to do things like send absentee ballots through the mail or things like cash through the mail. Because you see, the reason why we don't do such things is because the incompetence and corruption of the postal workers today prevents us from doing so. Send cash in the mail and you can pretty much guarantee that it will be sniffed out, opened, and stolen by your handy-dandy U.S. postal worker somewhere along its intended journey. So we can alleviate some of this simply by making the responsibility for that much clearer. Because let's face it, if you have tracking, scan, start, and finish, guess what? you know who had it last. And if it disappeared from the system at some point, there's only a couple of people to talk to. That'd be nice. And if you don't have a postal workers union, guess what? You can actually do your investigation and get rid of anyone who's got a little bit of sticky fingers, especially around Christmas time. And oh, have we had stories about postal workers who during the holiday season Just pull the Jeep off the side of the road and rifle through all the packages to see what goodies they can bring to their own family. We can put an end to that. Here's another idea. The Postal Service generally has had a fairly high proportion of veterans from the armed forces in it, historically. Less so today. Maybe we should make the Postal Service 
kind of a premium service for veterans. Number one, they tend to be more honest. They tend to be more service focused. They tend to be a lot more patriotic and they tend to be tougher. So when it's snowing out, you know, they might actually make the delivery. So why don't we take some of the openings that we're going to have when we get rid of the unionized hacks and make them available to veterans, say returning from Afghanistan in the Middle East into a job market that thanks to the pandemic is abysmal and give them an opportunity to work their way up through the ranks of the Postal Service. By the way, the ranks of the Postal Service, it's a wedding cake. Let's flatten it into more like a pancake. And let's do a practice that UPS has long uh, undertaken, which is that you would get no position within the service unless you've been a mail carrier first. That enables you to learn the business from the ground up. People who work at UPS maintain a uniform for delivery and are expected periodically to put that uniform on and go out with their people and make deliveries. That's part of the culture. Why not have that be part of our postal service culture so you don't have people wearing suits and ties and knowing not a bit about what it takes to get a package to a person? My, that would be a good start, wouldn't it? Here's another thing. Is part of the problem in the Postal Service is is that they don't do a very good job in expeditious sortation and movement of material. So there's a whole lot that has to happen when it gets from Grammy's home in San Diego and is put into her mailbox and finally winds up in Junior's mailbox in New Jersey. So we need people who are knowledgeable about logistics who can make it happen. Now, we've covered in a story previously that as malls go dormant, Amazon is snapping some of them up to be sortation centers. You always need more sortation centers. You always need, it's always easier to move things point to point short distances than it is to move them over road long distances. The reason being is you can only fit so much in a trailer. Once you fill up the tractor trailer, you can't really get to the things in the nose, right? So the more point to point we have, paradoxically, the better it tends to be. This, by the way, was Southwest Airlines model, right? Which deviated from the old hub and spoke model favored by the major airlines, before Southwest. So it would be a good idea to look at the Postal Service Network. I would say it would be a brilliant idea to piggyback off of existing logistic networks by taking their excess capacity and being able to use it for letter traffic. For example, Amazon.com leaves about half their warehouse space mothballed most of the year, only picking up when it becomes the holiday shopping season. As a retailer, that makes a lot of sense. Why couldn't you take your excess package capacity and feed it through during the off times of year? Now, sure, would that mean that that your network would need to change at peak times? Yes, but it changes anyway. And there are deals to be had. Warehousing now that's not e-com and is not uh, grocery is kind of going very cheap. Here's another idea. Is why don't we wind down some useless state and federal government operations, free up their real estate, and use it for postal uh, sortation? Why, we could even take some of the folks that are doing nothing, pushing paper from one desk to another, and have them push a letter from one sortation center to another. Wouldn't that be great? These things can be done. It just takes a little bit of innovation and a little bit of sweat to make them happen. But certainly... 
we have learned enough about logistics and supply chain. And we've seen enough of the potential for what can be done from the private enterprise that there's no reason, aside from laziness, incompetence, and corruption, why we couldn't do that in the U.S. Postal Service. Because here's the other thing. The alternative is we take the letter traffic and we outsource it to the highest bidder or I'm sure, to the lowest bidder, I guess, would be the case, given this is government stuff, and let them deal with it. Now, either way, I think you'd see better performance than you see today in the incredible, bloated, yet shrinking, in terms of service, United States Postal Service, which has been an utter disgrace compared to its halcyon days earlier in the 20th century. What does this tell us about the culture that exists today and the culture that's desired for the U.S. Postal Service? Well, number one, today, the customer is always wrong. They prize an easy day over getting every package where it needs to go on time. They're unwilling to stick their neck out unless they're overpaid for it. That's what their overtime crack means. What we clearly need is to be able to get more package volume out within a standard shift than is happening today. And their response is, is, ah, no, the package volume uh, is more than can be done. My effort is going to be constant to decline and you'll just pay me the overtime which is completely backwards in how they got in this mess. You see, one of the things they don't prize in the Postal Service is competition. There's no competitive fire. They don't look at it as, hey, today's the day we're going to do it better than UPS and FedEx. You will never hear that sentiment in the Postal Service. Guarantee you. What you will see is a desire the government place its heavy hand on the scale and make impossible the productivity that is enjoyed within private sector package delivery today. But I think when you look at the bloated bureaucratic culture that exists today, it pales in comparison to what we really need. It it goes back to that old motto of the Postal Service. Neither rain, nor snow, nor gloom of night will prevent this appointed carrier, I'm sorry, this carrier, from making his appointed rounds. A glorious statement of culture, if ever there were one. Goes back, really, when you think about it, to the Roman Empire, and how the messengers of the Roman Empire used to race flat out on those wonderful Roman roads that were built just for this purpose. From the center of the empire in the imperial city of Rome to the furthest flung provinces of it carrying the latest news riding their horses until they practically collapsed from exhaustion whereupon they would dismount catch something to eat and then quickly take another to the next post. That's the spirit that needs to be recaptured within the culture of the U.S. Postal Service. That's the sense of mission that is required. Will anyone pick up that torch? Doesn't look like it, at least not at the moment. Perhaps the answer is to take somebody who had success at, say, UPS and bring them in to clean up the Postal Service. Give them a free hand, the way so many governors have taken a free hand in this pandemic, and just say, that's it. Clean piece of paper. Do what needs to be done. And I bet you'd see pretty quickly some improvements made. There was a movie some years ago from a book some years before which featured Kevin Costner 
And it was about a post-nuclear America where a drifter finds a postman's uniform and uses it to inspire the country to knit back together after the devastation of that nuclear war. And you look at it today, (laughs) and it is such a silly notion. The only way that book got written and that movie got made was because the opinion of the Postal Service was so much higher a generation ago than it is today. If you pitched such a thing today, even if you had Kevin Costner very interested in making it, you would get laughed out of the room. It'd be like having a major motion picture which celebrates the hard work of the Department of Motor Vehicles. Just impossible. But there's no reason, if you have the right leadership, that you can't instill the right culture. God knows, within the federal government, the United States military has managed to build a winning culture any number of times. The recipe isn't all that hard, but it does require committed leadership. And I think that's what we've been missing all along. We'll see if Mr. DeJoy has any to offer, or if he's simply going to produce policy documents and then marvel when they fail. Right now, it doesn't look very promising. Have a great day. I got to go check my mail and hope that maybe something is coming.